Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, founder of Migraine Nation and lindsayweitzel.com. I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. And our guest today is Dr. Betsy Grinch. Hello, Dr. Grinch. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am great. So many of you may know Dr. Grunch from social media as Lady Spine Doc. Dr. Grunch is a neurosurgeon specializing in minimally invasive spine surgery. She works out of the Longstreet Clinic for Neurosurgery in Georgia. She is really fun. We are excited to have her on today. And we are going to learn about pseudotumor cerebri, also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and the role of a neurosurgeon. So let's start um, just talking about what we should call this, because the name can be confusing and it has a lot of names. So I find it to be kind of difficult. Some people call it pseudotumor, high pressure headache, IIH. What do you like to call it, Dr. Grunch? I think all of those names are commonly used. And I think it's important to know that they're all the same thing. The preferred way I like to refer to it is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Pseudotumor just sounds kind of more scary, in my opinion, because it has the word tumor in it, but uh, IIH is what I kind of uh, typically refer to it with my patients. And can we break that down? What does that mean in idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Very good question. So intracranial hypertension, intracranial first off means inside the head or inside the cranium and hypertension means elevated pressure. So when we talk about blood pressure, we call that hypertension, but when we're talking about CSF pressure, that's intracranial hypertension. So too much pressure inside of the head and also is known as hydrocephalus. But, you know, when we're talking specifically about IIH, there's not a known cause. So in other cases of ele elevated intracranial pressure, there may be something that's causing it, whether it be tumor blockage of the pathways, head trauma with swelling of the brain, bleeding on the brain, stroke, other reasons. But idiopathic means we really don't know why someone has it. So it kind of happens without a known cause. And that's, so that's why we call it idiopath idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Say that five times fast. <laughs> yeah, I know. So we're going to call it IIH. IIH. Uh, now that everyone knows what it is. And the other reason, well, there's a few reasons it's difficult to discuss on the podcast sometimes. But the other one is that maybe not everyone knows what CSF or cerebral spinal fluid is. Can you give a quick discussion of what that is and why we have it? Yeah. So CSF or spinal fluid, I think most people kind of have an idea of what spinal fluid is. It's a fluid that naturally bathes the brain and spinal cord. So our, our brain and our spinal cord are as part of our central nervous system. It makes us who we are. It makes all the nerves conduct in our body to, to feel, to move all of those things. And so it's kind of suspended or floats around inside of our body in CSF or fluid. So it's buoyant and, and our brain produces this fluid and it circulates inside of the brain around our spinal cord, through our spinal cord, and then circulates back all the way back to our brain to be resorbed. And that fluid provides nutrients to our brain and then it also excretes waste. So it allows our brain to kind of clear itself. So it's, it's the circulatory system of the nervous system, if you will. So this is one of the things I think it's so important to make clear because Often it isn't clear. Let's talk about the symptoms of IIH. What are the symptoms and it, how can we make them stand out perhaps from other types of headache? How do we know that, it's, that IIH is different from these other headaches that so many of us get? Yeah, so the symptoms of IIH can range. So it can be headaches to visual disturbances to cranial nerve palsy. So Headaches is the most common. I mean, if we have too much pressure inside of our skull, patients will complain of headaches. It's usually diffuse, it's dull, it's throbbing. Usually it's worse in the morning because you've been laying down all night or it, it's worse when you lay down. And then it can be improved a little bit if you stand up because then the fluid will kind of flow out of your brain. The headache can worsen when you do things that um, with a Valsalva maneuver. So think of Valsalva meaning bearing down. So like if you're going to poop or strain, or you're coughing or you're sneezing, that headache can worsen. And then if the pressure builds up high, higher, um, patients can then have visual symptoms. 
So that's because of pressure on the optic nerve. So patients can have blurry vision, double vision, and they can have visual field deficits where they actually can't see peripheral field. And papilledema is kind of sometimes how they find it. They may go to their eye doctor because of these blurry vision. The eye doctor will look in the back of your eyes. You know, you've been to the eye doctor, they'll put those dilating drops and look and what they're doing is really opening up that pupil so they can get a good light. And that exam is so cool because it allows us to really see directly into the brain, really into our nervous system. So if they see signs of swelling of the optic nerve, that means the brain is swollen too. And so that can lead to the diagnosis of pseudotumor. And then if it's untreated, this visual loss can even be permanent. And that's one of like the scary things about IIH is that it can result in that. Other symptoms can be pulsatile tinnitus. That means like, you know, hearing a whooshing sound or pulsing sound in your ears. Often that's pretty common and overlooked. It can even cause, you know, back pain, neck pain, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, balance, other things like that too. Does IIH often cause brain fog? It can, absolutely. I mean, anything where our brain isn't functioning at our best from disturbances related to pressure absolutely causes brain fog. So are there any people that are more likely to develop this or do we know are there any risk factors? Yes. So we know that patients that are overweight are more subjected to develop IIH, particularly if it's central obesity. So where our weight is more distributed on our belly. And the thought is, is that that increased intra-abdominal pressure can cause increased venous pressure and then impair the way we're resorbing CSF. Um, sometimes these adipose derived hormones like leptin, inflammatory cytokines, those can also affect the way our CSF dynamics um, work. And uh, those are some of the issues. We also know it happens in women, usually of childbearing age. So the typical demographic we think of as, as physicians, now it can vary. This is not, this is, you know, the more generalized is a young uh, woman of childbearing age so in their 20s, 30s that's overweight. And that's because uh, women of childbearing age, there may be a hormonal link to that type of thing. So, yeah. What type of physician usually diagnoses this and how is it diagnosed? It can be diagnosed by any physician that really detects these symptoms. And that's why awareness of this as a pathology is so important because, you know, usually young women is a typical age demographic. And to be honest, young women is the, is the population that is typically gaslit for these unusual symptoms, headaches, migraines, mm -hmm. brain fog, like how many of us complain of that? And so they, they get blown off. But it's important to recognize that a patients with migraines and blurry vision, that's not normal. And so investigating that further, asking these questions, is it worse when you lay down? Is it worse when you cough? And to know that it, it can be outside of that demographic. So primary care can diagnose it. It's often, as I mentioned a minute ago, can be diagnosed by eye doctors who are doing that examination, looking at the retina, seeing papilledema. I would say, you know, a lot of my patients come to me with pseudotumor because they were diagnosed by their eye doctor because of those vision complaints. And then neurology, they often get sent to neurology for intractable headaches. It can't be necessarily managed by the PCP, so they get sent on to neurology. So those are the, you know, the typically three most common specialties that will identify this. Okay. And how is it diagnosed other than with the eye exam? Do you generally need to have a CSF pressure reading for a diagnosis? Yes. So, you know, if we suspect it, then how it's diagnosed is by a, a lumbar puncture because, I mean, the intrinsic name of the diagnosis is intracranial hypertension. So you kind of need to know what the pressure is to make the diagnosis. So that can be done on a spinal tap um, and you measure that opening pressure. So you measure the pressure within the spinal uh, spinal canal. And, and we there's a range of numbers. Usually we use 20 millimeters of mercury um, as our like threshold for being above that would be abnormal. So if their opening pressure is greater than 20, uh, then we would be suspect that it's abnormal. And then they may have some type of hypertension going on I'm looking into that further. So is the first line of therapy, is it something conservative? Are there medications? Do you go straight to some sort of procedure or surgery? What types of therapies are done for IAH? Typically, the first line treatment is going to be medication. And if they, if they, it depends on, you know, how severe the symptoms are, like if it's impending vision loss, those kinds of things, 
But most times we're going to start with, if they are obese, talking about weight loss, because that's going to be the most effective long-term treatment. Uh, and, and we're not talking about massive weight loss, even a five to 10% reduction of body weight can significantly improve your symptoms. If somebody, you know, bariatric surgery can be considered too. Um, there's really exciting data that I reviewed in the past about the, even GLP ones and the thought that these medications, yeah, of course they help with weight loss, but they can actually change the way CSF production happens. And so if we make less spinal fluid, then it would help the symptoms of IH outside of weight loss. So like you start, you know, your ozempic or whatever, um, your headaches can be immediately beneficial even before your weight loss. So that's very interesting. And I, I think more data um, remains to be seen on that. But outside of weight loss, acetazolamide is a medicine that will start that it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So it actually reduces production of CSF. That's the first line treatment. And then Topamax is another one that can also help reduce CSF production and help with uh, with headaches. And it's often used again in weight loss and it can help with that as well. So those are the most common medication treatments. And then, you know, we kind of step it up a little bit. Sometimes we'll do a therapeutic lumbar puncture. So what I mean by that is we can drain off spinal fluid and that might temporize someone. It's not a long-term solution, but that can definitely help symptoms. Our CSF reproduces very quickly. So again, it's not a long-term. If it's more visual field, uh, optic nerve, nerve sheath fenestration can be helpful. So we're, we have swelling of the optic nerve, which is the nerve that goes from our brain to our eyes. And if those nerves swell because of high pressure, they're swelling inside of that casing of the nerve. So sometimes we'll fenestrate it or cut little slits into that casing to allow it to swell a little bit more. So it'll help the vision. Um, and so that's, that's kind of uh, interesting. It can help prevent vision loss. And of course, where someone like me may become involved in a case of IIH is a surgical procedure called a shunt and which will actually take fluid off of the brain and then drain it, drain it into usually the abdomen to help reduce that pressure. So it sounds like there's a lot of options, both medication wise, lifestyle intervention wise and procedure wise. For this specific diagnosis, I think the question is uh, more getting the diagnosis for someone who has this problem instead of just assuming you have migraine, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that that can be a problem in this instance? Do you think a lot of people assume they have some other type of headache? I think initially, you know, I mean, when it gets into the vision problems, that's often late in the game. And, and, and sadly, that's when most of these diagnoses are made. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't go from zero to 60. It's usually this process that happens over time. So they don't get diagnosed earlier enough. They're maybe thought to have migraines or another type of headache disorder. And then it's not until these more obvious signs that help us make that diagnosis. And by that time, sometimes these conservative treatments may not be as helpful and they may kind of intervene and upscale into their next step of treatment and may have to have surgery, you know, sooner than, than anticipated. Do you have any statements to make as far as how effective known treatments are for IIH? I think the most important thing is making the right diagnosis. I think the treatments really vary on where you're at in the game. If you if you diagnose it and the pressure is incredibly high, there's no way that, you know, probably less effective first line treatments. So there's a stepwise flow of how we typically treat treat these patients and ultimately the last step or shunting is uh, almost, you know, curative basically, but those shunts can fail. So it's an ongoing uh, uh, problem. It is a curable condition in some instances, like if there is weight loss, if, it, if the weight is really the issue, then, you know, lose weight, it could cure this without any other treatments. So it really just kind of varies on where in the pathway that patient is and how successful the treatments may be. Is there anything that you think we missed or didn't touch on anything you'd like to add before we go today? I just think, you know, this is a condition in which this demographic of women that I say women because they're the most common to have it get gaslit and it's often a source of frustration and they get into the medical circle almost jaded because they've been told that it's okay, that there's nothing wrong or whatever the case may be. The imaging may be normal. Um, and, and so I think it's important to realize that if you feel like you're having symptoms, 
that aren't being recognized by your provider to get another opinion because you know it's it's so important to be proactive about your own health we all know our own bodies better than anyone else we live in them so if you if you really think something is wrong go get another opinion and and see and kind of look into this diagnosis if you're having some of these symptoms that that we talked about well i'm very glad that you chose to close with that that is Gaslighting is something that we have dedicated entire podcast episodes to on this particular podcast. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you everyone for joining us. And please join us for the next episode of Headwise. Thank you.